and I just, can you raise your hand if you're currently a teacher in this room? Um, so first I just want to applaud yeah. them because um, we are the, the folks that are in front of our children for six, seven, sometimes eight hours a day. And so without really um, attending to uh, and holding up the value that teachers have, we're only going to get so far. So I know that deeply, even though I haven't been in the classroom, I still um, hold that to be very true. I started, um, I was a teacher at Hawthorne. Um, Emma spoke a little bit at Hawthorne. It was during that time had the dubious distinction of being the largest uh, elementary school in Northern California. And it was, um, it was a camp, it was, uh, we were situated on a campus that was meant to serve 600 students. And so for those of you who um, weren't around during that time, we had year-round schools. And the reason why we had year-round schools, it was because that was the only way we could physically hold that many kids. That we would take 400 kids out of the picture at a time, they would be on vacation, and meanwhile, we would have 900 um, students as math work, and, and we would rotate, right? And so um, my, my first year of teaching, um, I did not have to, well, actually, step back. My second year of teaching, I was a roving teacher. Um, what it means to be a roving teacher meant that I didn't have my own classroom, okay? And so um, I would have to move every three to four weeks into the classroom of the teacher who, and, their, and the class that was on vacation. Um, and then three to four weeks later, I'd have to move again. When I was um, on for being a roving teacher, we were also um, modernizing the building of Hawthorne, which meant that um, in addition to moving classrooms, I, had, I basically had to move double during certain periods because we had to move out of the building into these temporary portables and then back in for the purposes of moving. So within one year, I moved classrooms um, about 12 times. And this was my second year of teaching. Um, I was still in an inter I was still an intern teacher. I was not even credentialed, um, so I struggled. <laughs> and we didn't even have coverage for our classrooms when we were in, we were moving. We just kind of had to figure out what to do with these 30 to 10 and 11 year old bodies while we were moving from classroom to classroom. So I just want to give you a little picture. And I say that for a couple of reasons. One, because where we are today, we are so far from where we were. And that's because of the work that was done by folks like Emma and Liz and that push and see by so many people in the room who made it possible that that's actually, we have some, we have some hard stories to tell right now around what our kids experience, but we have less of those stories. And it's because of how far we've come. So I just want to recognize just, you know, kind of collectively the work that's been done and, and what allowed us, that allowed us to do this work. About 22 boys, because my first year of teaching, um, <laughs> I had 22 boys and, and nine girls, and I had the lowest readers in the entire fourth and fifth grade circuit. And I didn't know why until the end of my first year when um, the fourth and fifth grade circuit were given the job of designing the class list for the following year. And that's where I got to see how classes were composed of, oh, I'll take that kid. I'll take, no way am I taking that kid. Let's put them on that roster. Well, that roster, it was the roster of the new hires for the following year. Your brand new teachers, often interns, um, I was also in the, a corner, in a, in a portable in the corner of Hawthorne, right by um, Salsal Creek. And so, um, you know, at least once a week I had to call the custodian or deal with myself the um, dirty condoms and needles um, in that corner because we were so isolated. So just to give you a picture of, of I, as a teacher, I was, and a brand new teacher, I had the heart, I loved these children so much, and I was not set up for success. And I think that a lot of our teachers continue to feel that experience of our heart is there, we want to do well, we know that our children deserve so much more, and we're not provided the conditions um, to grow, to, um, to develop, to do anything really beyond um, surviving which is what I managed to do for long enough until I was in an environment that I helped to create where I had that experience to have um, the opportunity of real collegial um, 
collaboration. So it was um, in this environment that um, a group of us in Hawthorne, again, there were 1,400 kids. I don't remember how many faculty. Hi, Jamie. <laughs> Jamie was a founding principal of ICS. There were like 65, 70 teachers. Does that sound right? 65. Yeah, 65. So a group of teachers created what we called the, um, the B cohort because there were four tracks, A, B, C, D. And um, we came together because we recognized that teachers, that students needed a coherent experience and that students needed teachers who were in conversation with each other over time. And so we created our own little pathway. This was totally teacher driven and initiated so that those kindergarten kids would um, go from Ms. Vidal and then they would go into Ms. Wallach's class and then Ms. Wegner's and so on. Right, so we created our own little pathway. And when we learned about the small schools movement, we hopped on board because it was like, oh, that sounds like what we're trying to do in these really difficult conditions. So um, the, the Hawthorne, the ICS experience was really teacher um, driven and it not only, um, not only allowed us to create an environment that both allowed us to thrive but also got us closer to what we wanted to be true for students. It was all transformative for us. And I say this to the teachers because um, it's really, really hard work. And I think you know this. I know that many of you are meeting on Sundays, you're meeting at nights, you're full-time teachers, and you're doing this above and beyond. Um, and so it takes a lot of heart. It's a lot of sacrifice. Um, and in some ways, it's just kind of what it is. But it it's just such a transformative experience to be a part of something where you really, um, you get to, you have the opportunity to shape as teachers, as those who are with um, these children for longer, particularly in elementary. You're with children longer than their parents are sometimes, right? And so what are you, um, how, how are you really thinking about what that means for those children? So, you know, really thinking about um, lessons learned. I, I think there's, there's always a balance of what is it that you as, you know, we all continue to be classroom teachers and really hold the space of and hold the vision um, throughout, you know, the, the design but also the opening of the school um, of what is it that you really need to be coming together about. Um, is it really about where the copy machine is going to go? Um, is it really about um, you know, yard duty schedules. I think there was, there was a level of like um, uh, just ultra ownership um, of that group, which could sometimes go a little bit too far. And um, I think a lack of recognition of, of, you know, some division of duties of like, this is something that, that really needs to be held by the principal. This is something that's really held by the, the teacher community. This is, this is a place where we really need to be bringing in community. Um, so that's, that's one thing I would say. I mean, what I learned after I went, uh, I was at ICS for four years, and, um, and then I, I traveled with many of our kids to UPA and taught eighth grade there, where half of my students were my fifth grade students three years prior, which was awesome. And um, I got to see an experience at UPA where there was a, a, a really intentional um, design of distributive teacher leadership that wasn't quite in place at International Community School. And so I think much of what we've seen, UPA is one of our most successful schools, period, and definitely middle schools, is, it can definitely be attributed to the um, intentionality and the, the, the collective ho um, holding of the vision. Uh, the other thing that happened um, at ICS is that um, Janie was principal for a couple years and she left. Um, I won't go into her story right now, but um, there, was, there wasn't a process at the district level yet of engaging community around principal selection. And so we had a series of principals at ICS that, that did not hold the vision and weren't interested, um, at least in one of the experiences when I was still there, and hearing the stories and really understanding what the vision was and where it came from and where we had, we had come. And so even the role of the teacher leaders was, um, uh, was a little bit squashed, a little bit repressed, and I think that, that really um, affected the spirit of, of a lot of the teachers and the founding teachers in that building. So 
the value of having um, teachers as a, you know, playing a central role in the design is that we were really able to think about um, uh, the articulation of learning experiences um, for students from the onset. And so the, there were things that we were already in conversation about as the B cohort that we were trying to just create more coherence. Um, and, and being in the design process really allowed us to go deep and one, first, what we wanted to be true for students and what that meant for us um, as teachers and to help us build those experiences. And so, you know, if down to like what are the types of reading strategies we're trying to build in each grade and how are we, how are we building a continuum of experiences where it spirals, where it connects, where we know that we're building on um, the experience of, of the previous teacher and that it's not, we're not starting from point zero every year. So having, um, and, and as a part of our, our design experience, we had um, uh, we had signed around you know being a social justice oriented school where we were really focused on what um, how do we expose even our young children to some of the global issues and how it plays out in a local context, and we really tied that to the rights of the, the international <coughs> rights of the child. Um, so that was a framework that we were able to use to build out our curriculum that was shared across. So even even though the content um, might you know would change from year to year, there was a there was a continuity of experience and something um, uh, competencies and a frame of mind that we were trying to build in children that was only possible really by having teachers come together and understand what does that mean instructionally, what does that mean in terms of curriculum. Um, what does that mean in terms of our own professional development and need for collaboration? Um, we were the pioneer generation, so yes, we, uh, we got to be, you know, are now the elders that people got to learn from our mistakes. We made a lot of mistakes, and, and I think centrally, people saw the mistakes we were making and, you know, got to kind of readjust um, accordingly. Um, so we, uh, I remember the RFP process very well because it was, you know, finally released in like October, November back in 2000, um, and the, the results were released in February. I was actually on vacation, because remember I was at year-round school. I was somewhere, I'm sure, tropical, and found out that, um, uh, that we, we got our proposal approved. It was February, and we were opening in September. And we were full-time teachers. <laughs> And we were still struggling to figure out, like, you know, who's going to pull the short straw to be the principal? <laughs> you know, like, we all wanted to be in the classroom. And we, we had so many things that we were really trying to figure out that we needed a lot more time. And there were certainly moments that, even around this theme of social justice, that once we were you know, we were in play and, you know, school was open. We're like, oh, your idea of social justice isn't the same as my idea of social justice because we were, you know, dealing with, um, with having to, to work out all of the logistics and plan out the master schedule and, you know, engage community in authentic ways and all the things that um, didn't give us the time that we really needed that um, I heard Trump say that you took the time and insisted on that time to really understand. Um, where people were and how to bring people in in a really intentional way. So um, I'm really excited that there's going to be an entire year for design teams to really work together and, um, and with that kind of intentional um, incubation and, and just time to really, but taking that time to really make sure that you're on the same page um, is, is one of the lessons that I hope people would learn from. During our proposal writing period and then afterwards, we um, we were working with Basie's um, coaches, and um, I worked with we worked with Mark Gordon, and he kept pushing us of you know you know you're not trying to create a pint-sized Hawthorne. <laughs> That's not what you're not doing. Everything you did at Hawthorne and like making it smaller because we were like be cohort. We got it. You know we got it figured out, and it, the push was no. What do you really um, what what do you really want to be true for students? I keep saying that because I feel like that's, that needs to be the question that you always come back to. What needs to be true for kids? Um, and, and then to really think outside of the possibilities, even if, even if you go too far and you need to be reined in, if you didn't allow yourself to go there, then that possibility never exists for kids. And, you know, and, and since this experience, and I feel like what we did for us felt really innovative and really out of the box. And part of it is, you know, we've come a long way as a district, um, and you know, it was, it was one context. In some ways, I felt like we, we could have gone further, um, and we could have been pushed further out of the box. I just would encourage design teams 
um, part of what I know you'll be doing is vis visiting schools and absolutely visit schools where you have populations of kids that look like ours and you know they're doing good things. I, I mean, that primarily needs to be what we're doing. Where, where are we seeing our population of kids having success? But also go to where our population of kids are not because what we see happening in the private schools and in the schools where um, it's only for those families who can pay that, that amount of money, there is a lot of out-of-the-box um, uh, learning experiences. I would encourage you to go there too because why, why, why not, why can't our students have those type of experiences as well? Why not? And I, I also just want people to think about what, I mean, what it would it be for the richest, I'm not just talking about money, but like the most enriching experience for students. Everything that they would really need to have. And, you know, it's, we don't, we, we're, we're limited, we have some constraints, but at least you went there. Because then you can boil down and say, what is the essence of that? And what do we want to be true for kids? So I, I just want to encourage my, my, one of my biggest pieces of advice is just to allow yourself to go there. You know, if you had no limitations of funding, if you had no limitations of district bureaucracy and central office mandates, what would it look like? Just do the what is. <laughs>